morning, everybody. Um, so, you know, we were sort of asked today to, to, to bring some of our perspectives within education on uh, the issue of uh, the disciplining of, of black bodies, obviously, in conversation with Tani Secord's um, and book. So, um, for me, uh, I, uh, I'm going to take probably a little, little less personal of a stance, um, although I feel this stuff uh, very deeply personally, um, just because, you know, I have a son who's six years old and in the public schools and I'm busy fighting sort of um, uh, uh, the disciplining of, of all those bodies of, of those kids um, and, uh, and, and sort of trying to help his school think through stuff around discipline in particular of, of uh, African American kids in that space. Um, but so what I want to do is, you know, the first thing that jumped to my mind and where, where my head's been at lately has been trying to think through a lot about, um, you know, really, when we, I think a lot about education policy uh, and the role that that plays in the disciplining of, of, of black bodies in particular. And so, you know, a lot of my work has been focusing on uh, high stakes testing, high stakes standardized testing, its history, its uh, empirical impact on classrooms. Um, and, and so that's what sort of immediately came to my mind around, okay, this, this, this is where I see our policies, um, uh, uh, our policies, you know, operate in very, very particular ways um, to have really disparate impacts on black and brown kids, um, in particular, and working class kids as well. You know, the first thing I would like to point out about the test, and, and really I want to say this about the history of standardized testing, um, in a way you could argue that, that these tests have always been about disciplining um, uh, marginalized populations. Okay, even if you go back to the beginning of standardized testing in this country, um, you know, all, all those early psychologists, you know, um, they, they, they all, Terman, Yerkes, all those guys, they, they all thought they had an objective measurement of, of human populations, and they gave it out, they gave those exams, and uh, they believed in this idea of a biological, quantifiable idea of intelligence, and they, you know, incorporated this idea of the IQ, intelligence quotient. Um, and, you know, and they found at that time, right, when they gave these tests out, they're supposedly objective tests that, of course, you know, poor people were less intelligent than rich people and that, um, and that uh, African Americans and, and Native Americans and Latinos were less intelligent than white people, uh, that immigrants were less intelligent than those folks born in the U.S. Uh, and, so, and so you can see in this, this beginning part of the test um, about how the test then gets used to justify a, a dominant social order, right? Um, and so, what basically what they were finding with these tests was nothing objective about them. It was actually just um, uh, reflecting uh, uh, the, the race and class uh, relations that were sort of existent in, in U.S. society at the time. So that, that's one piece. And so I think, okay, we go back then and go, okay, these tests really, they, from the beginning, they, they were about racialization and they were about, I, I would argue, um, uh, the establishment and maintenance of white supremacy, okay, at that time. And you saw those test scores and the, and the, the data that, are, that arose from those scores uh, being used to justify tracking, right? Um, and then being used to justify specific programs for like Mexican-American students, say, in the Southwest, in Texas, and New Mexico, right? That's saying, oh, uh, because, because Mexicans are X and Mexican-Americans are X, and, and this is where the, how they score on these tests, then this is the kind of education that they should be getting. Okay, um, uh, and the same, same kind of conversations were happening for African Americans uh, as well. And, and so, um, and, and, you know, and of course, I want to be clear, there was resistance at the time, right? Um, if, if you look at, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, read the work of, of Blanton, Blanton's got great work on the resistance that was happening in, in the um, Mexican American community. Of course, Du Bois was even speaking out, uh, you know, in, in the 30s and 40s about, about the problems with the tests and how they were being used to justify um, uh, racism at the time. Now, we feel like that's 100 years ago, okay, but the point I want to make about our, any, any quote-unquote achievement gaps that we have with tests now is that our, our findings, our data that's produced from our supposedly currently objective, quote-unquote objective tests, actually show the same thing that they did 100 years ago, right? Uh, if you, if you want to take any of our major standardized, high-stake standardized tests, uh, they'll, say, they'll, they'll produce an achievement gap around, around income, Right, or income inequality. Uh, we know Seattle has one of the highest racial uh, achievement gaps by test scores as well in terms of African Americans versus whites. 
Um, we see uh, uh, ELL students uh, uh, not doing as well in the tests as, as, um, as English language uh, folks whose uh, native language is, is English. And so, and so it, to me, I have, I, have, I have to raise this question about how the tests, like, are the tests really objective now? Okay, that should be the first thing. What are they measuring? Okay, and then more importantly to this conversation, how, how are they being used, right, in the context? Because then what happens is, with our current testing regime, failure gets, con failure gets concentrated within communities of color, okay? And so because of that then, the, uh, uh, the policy decisions, the policy impacts connected to those tests then have a, a sharp, dis sharply disparate impact on those communities. All right, so that those communities, those kids are getting uh, forms of education that uh, are not as, as broad or as deep, like they're getting more and more teaching to the test in those communities. Uh, you, you know, folks, if it's not on the test, uh, in low-income communities of color, uh, seeing the curriculum, you know, basically, you know, stripped down to whatever's on the test, you lose things like social studies, or you lose things like science, or art, or music, or recess. Um, these things get, are, can get considered extraneous for, <coughs> to the production of test scores. And so, and so part of the reason why, why I raise that is because then we, we can look, that, look at that and go, okay, there's, a, there's a, a thing that these tests do, and actually Foucault has a whole chapter on the examination that's worth looking at, and the role that the examination does in terms of sort of making, um, uh, uh, making things uh, that, are, that are sort of marked deviant, making them visible so that then they, so that then they can be targeted for, for intervention, right? And, in this, and this comes in the context of discipline and punish in particular. Um, and, so, and so the exams, I would argue, actually do a they, they form a disciplinary eye, right? They, in, terms of, in terms of the visual eye, and, and they get used, tests get used, high stakes tests get used to, um, to, to essentially uh, punish these kids in these communities in, uh, in, in ways that are detrimental to the education, actually, um, and actually working against, uh, um, working against uh, any notions of, of, of Equal, of, uh, of the production of, of equality. Um, you know, and probably the, uh, the most sort of damning piece of evidence related to all this was a study by Baker and Lang um, that actually they found a pretty strong correlation uh, that, uh, between high stakes, high stakes exit exams, right, uh, high school exit exams, and, and, uh, and the, the increased likelihood of being incarcerated. So there's a role that the tests actually play in supporting the school's prison pipeline, right? Particularly if you're looking at high school exit exams. They actually found a 12.5% increase in the rate of incarceration um, in, in the states that they studied that had high school exit exams. And so I think that really illustrates sort of in, 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 a, like in, in, a, in a very singular way um, that the tests end up uh, um, uh, being used to identify particular kinds of difference and, then use, and discipline those form, those the discipline um, that difference uh, um, that ends up being, you know, about the disciplining of uh, black and brown bodies. There's other things we could talk about about what testing does to classroom spaces, classroom cultures, um, uh, and sort of the disciplinary mechanism that happens in those space and who gets considered deviant, and then um, uh, really sort of creating, I would say, places where kids want to act out because of the structures that are being placed on them, and then, and then the disproportionate discipline that follows from that, I think that'd be another, another way to go with this. Um, so I think I've done most of my time. I don't want to take up too much, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Holly Schindler, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet. Um, and so I'm going to be I've been asked to kind of connect the readings to my field in particular, which is early childhood. Um, but I want to preface my comments by saying that for a good portion of my career, uh, a lot of my research has also focused on economically disadvantaged fathers, a majority of whom are black and brown fathers. So as someone up here who I'm clearly white, I'm female, I grew up in a middle class household, um, and so I've spent many nights, days, months, years, really learning from other people through this research. So striving to learn uh, from my peers, from practitioners and community organizations, and especially from fathers themselves. So I'm excited to be here today because I'm really, I'm really most excited here to learn from all of you. Um, but as a panel member, member, of course, I've also been asked to share some of my thoughts uh, about Between the World and Me. Uh, from a personal standpoint, I'll just say I felt many 
emotions reading this text, as I'm sure many of you did, so pain, sadness, guilt, frustration, um, but also sometimes empowerment and even a little bit of hope. Um, what I'm going to share today isn't any resolution to those feelings, but I'm going to focus on connections and some questions I have about two central themes that are raised in the book. So the first is the struggle, and then the second, which is not surprising, is the father. Uh, so I was really struck by Coates' emphasis on the struggle. I think he, he you know, the, the book focuses on a number of challenges and obstacles, but to my recollection, the first time he names the struggle, which is the one that he named his son for, uh, was when he started talking about the Mecca. And so I'm, I'll, I'll give pages in case people want to jot down page numbers to find these, but he said, what was required was a new story, a new history, told through the lens of our struggle. I had always known this. And then he goes on, I had come to knowledge at the Mecca that my ancestors made, and I was compelled towards the Mecca by the struggle that my ancestors made. The struggle is in your name, Samori. You were named for Samori Touré, who struggled against French colonizers for the right to his own black body. We are, as Derek Bell once wrote, the faces at the bottom of the well. But there's really wisdom down here, and that wisdom accounts for so much of the good in my own life. So this struggle seems to drive Coates um, in his narrative, and it struck me that it has parallels to uh, a phenomenon called grit, which has been popularized in recent literature on early childhood and the devel development of resilience, and is part of the debate in education reform. Um, the struggle he refers to isn't exactly grit, but I think it's worth considering what the parallels are to this concept. So Paul Tuff probably is most well known for putting grit, grit on the map, so he's, he wrote a lot about Harlem Children's Zone. Um, and the idea behind grit as it's been applied in early childhood to children in poverty and children of color is that with grit, children will face challenges and struggles, but they say good things will come to those who tough it out, that grit's learned not through academic pursuits, but through facing uh, adversity outside of academic contexts and rituals, so much like Coates suggests that wisdom can come from struggle. So I think what I've, you know, I've been reading more about this recently, and while it can be an empowering concept, as he describes it to his son, uh, it also has been, con um, grit has been criticized, that concept in particular, for romanticizing hardship. Um, so a recent article that was also covered in the Washington Post discussed how real harm can come from romanticizing these struggles that build character. Uh, because doing so can teach or explain that poverty and racism are not bad, but that they create a path, and that they create a path out um, that does not involve any sacrifice on the, from the privileged classes. So the ones that Coates calls the dreamers, the ones who believe themselves white. So again, this is not quite the struggle that he's talking about to his son, but at the end of the book, he says. The struggle is really all I have for you because it's the only portion of this world under your control. I'm sorry that I cannot make it okay. I cannot save you, but not that sorry. Part of me thinks that your vulnerability brings you closer to the meaning of life. So I think, I, I think it's just something I was reflecting on and, and really left wanting to know more about this struggle and its meanings, its powers, its consequences for Coates and for his son. Um, and, and asking myself, is there danger in describing the struggle as a mechanism for survival and hope? So the second theme, um, the father. So for obvious reasons, I was drawn to this narrative given my work on fathers. So very early on, he talks about the black fathers who have died um, in his family, in his neighborhood, and the impacts of fear. Uh, so this idea of fear in the men in his life. So he says, Powerfully, I felt the fear in the visits to my Nana's home. You never knew her. I barely knew her. But what I remember is her hard manner, her rough voice. And I knew that my father's father was dead, and my uncle Oscar was dead, and that my uncle David was dead. And each of those instances was unnatural. And I saw it in my own father, who loves you, who counsels you, who slipped me money to care for you. My father was so very afraid. 
Um, so, so, so Kathy Eden and Timothy, Timothy Nelson are two scholars that I admire, and they took a deeper look at this kind of impact of fear on men and fathering in an ethnographic book, um, so you should check it out, it's called Doing the Best I Can, Fatherhood in the Inner City. Um, the, the, they started this ethnographic work over a decade ago, and what originally prompted their study was this question of, is it true that these, these fathers, which were unmarried, predominantly black fathers in the inner city, don't care about their children that they conceive? Which I think reflected the view at the time that they started doing this work, that unwed black fathers were a social problem that needed fixing. Uh, but their, you know, inevitably, their ethnographic work led to deeper questions like, what does fatherhood mean for these men? What are the barriers they face trying to children, father their children in the ways they want, and how do they respond to those challenges? So they ultimately go beyond, in their book, beyond the stereotype portrayals of black fathers in the inner city, and argue that to truly comprehend these fathers, that it's not sufficient to focus on men, the men themselves alone. Um, instead, understanding their environment, the, the neighborhood context, the histories of urban areas, and race is also essential. So this really aligns with what Coates talks about, and he recognizes this too. Um, he talks about his wife's father. She had never known her father, which put her in the company of greater, the greater number of everyone I'd known. I felt that these fathers were the greatest of cowards, but I also felt the galaxy was playing with loaded dice which ensured an excess of cowards in our ranks. So I've come to know that the loaded dice includes the structural barriers talked about in the book, but also um, there's been specific child support, child welfare, housing policies put in place that have stacked the dice disproportionately against low-income black and brown fathers. So um, one of my earlier experiences in graduate school, I spent a year interning at an organization through Boston Public Health called Father Friendly Initiative. It was a comprehensive initiative, it's still there today, and it uh, focuses on serving diverse low-income fathers, but many of them were in, in reintegrating into family life after serving time in prison. So it was during my time, I, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, walking with the dads to court, learning how to help them fill out paperwork, and learning their stories, and through that experience I became uh, aware of some of these policies, so such as child support payments that continue to accrue in the tens of thousands of dollars while the men spent, you know, eight or ten years in prison. Um, and these these policies, while I you can see the rationale for why they were why they were formed, disproportionately affected men of color and created barriers for them as they tried to become the the fathers that they wanted to be. Um, so these, these, policy, and these policies and others have been written widely about, especially in the late 1990s in books such as Fathers Under Fire by Erwin Garfinkel. Um, and then lastly, of course, the entire book Between the World and Me was really a letter almost from a father to a son. And so Coates reflects throughout the book on his own struggles with fathering, fatherhood from being told to man up to struggles to not be afraid when his four-year-old was playing with strangers in the preschool, white strangers, um, to learning how to be nurturing even when the cards were stacked against him. So uh, my, my last quote I'll read, but he, uh, he says we are, to his son, we are entering our last year together and I wish I had been softer with you. Your mother had to teach me how to love you, how to kiss you and tell you I love you every night. And now it does not feel a wholly natural act so much as it feels like a ritual, and that is because I am wounded. So this passage, this last passage in particular, struck me because it's this internal conflict he talks about is something I recognize from the experiences of the fathers who have participated in our study, um, fathers like Marcus, who immigrated from the United States to Mexico after his first child uh, was born and he reported running into prejudice, discrimination, a lack of support. He also reported that uh, caring for his children was the most important responsibility of all. So there are a lot of things I could have responded to in this book, but the, strug the struggle and the father are the, the two themes that really kind of resonated the most with my work and brought, made me think about connections and questions. Um, and you know, I'm still left with this, 
this question that plagues me, which is what can early childhood and family programs and policies do to better support instead of criminalize fathers of color who have kind of been, who have been wounded by the people and the systems that have been imposed on them. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, before I get started, I just uh, want to acknowledge the, um, the guardians of uh, these lands um, that we are you know, standing in uh, at the moment. Um, I wanted to kind of take the opportunity uh, today. I think um, you know, often uh, when I'm called on to uh, speak about these issues, um, I think people care to hear about the, uh, the academic uh, piece and, and what the work looks like and, and, and how I think about it and how I define it. Um, but, um, but I think uh, this particular book um, you know, has struck a different kind of chord <coughs> and, uh, and I hope a different kind of discourse so that we move from, from you know, solely uh, um, you know, thinking about issues of race as, a, as an academic endeavor and really trying to think about it in terms of what it means to the people um, that we encounter. Uh, on an everyday basis, and and um, and and so really, it's uh, it's about personalizing, you know, the, these uh, these experiences and and stories that are uh, that are shared, and you know, obviously, real people um, feel. Uh, so for me, I think um, uh, reading this book, I think I wanted to approach it in that way. I, I wanted to think about it as um, um, I, I I wanted to think about it as a, as a as a person who. You know, as a brown man who uh, <laughs> who was educated in this country, who attended schools here, and uh, as a as a father as well, um, and so it's a <laughs> it's a very emotional um, experience, I think, uh, for me. Um, so it, uh, I think one of the first things that uh, the way that I kind of read the book, um, um, so the author grew up more or less around the time that I grew up in a in a very different city. Um, but I connected a lot to, um, to that experience, and even though we were, you know, miles apart, um, there's something common about uh, growing up in a community <clears throat> in, in which uh, vulnerability is uh, at stake um, every day. Um, <clears throat> so it took me back, I, I came to the United States when I was about uh, nine years old. I immigrated with my family. Uh, we moved to um, a neighborhood in Los Angeles um, called Boyle Heights, and most people think about it as East LA, uh, predominantly immigrant uh, community. Um, and um, I would say within about a year of arriving uh, to the United States, um, I think uh, that vulnerability uh, was very clear uh, to me in terms of um, uh, what life uh, was like in this particular place and time. Um, and so at the about age of 10, and I think uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote about this uh, experience, you know, and this encounter with uh, police. Uh, but when I was about 10 and a half years old, um, you know, we happened to live right across the street from one of the largest high schools in, in the nation at the time, um, you know, close to 6,000 students at the high school. Um, I was about 10 years old. Um, and we didn't really actually go to the park. There was two parks in the neighborhood, uh, but we were advised against going to the parks because um, uh, there was a lot of gang activity. There were very dangerous drugs being sold and just a lot of crime. Uh, so our best place to go out and play was in the streets or in the parking lot of the school right across the street uh, from, our, from our house, from our apartment where we used to rent. Um, and. Um, I, I vividly recall, um, you know, Saturday morning, uh, many of us gathering uh, from our block and other blocks to go play um, baseball uh, right in, in the school parking lot. Um, and we're playing with tennis balls and we have one bad, no gloves, nothing, just swinging the, you know, at the ball. Um, and within about 30 minutes, uh, um, the alarm sound off. And when the alarm sound off in the school, it's a school alarm, um, you know, within minutes, there's like a policeman in the parking lot. And um, 
There was about 11 kids, and uh, the oldest one was probably about 14. Um, and most of us were probably 10, 11 years old. And um, so the police came in, and this is not school police, it's actually LAPD. Um, and they apprehended us, uh, they cuffed us, they sat us on the, um, on the, uh, on the sidewalk. Um, and at that moment, I didn't quite understand, you know, what was actually um, happening. Um, but uh, the only thing that I remember, you know, a few of the kids asking, you know, the ones who spoke a little bit more English was, um, was asking, why are you, you know, holding us here? And they mentioned something about some computers being stolen in the school. And, you know, we were just playing there. Um, and so we're sitting there and they're holding us and I kind of felt scared. Um, and we live right across the street and uh, um, I remember my mother uh, stepping outside of the apartment and looking out. And I remember seeing her looking at us uh, on the sidewalk. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I can remember that she was scared. Um, There's like, you know, six policemen and there's 11 kids and they were all on the sidewalk and um, <clears throat> I just remember her looking out and going back in the house and not coming back out again um, and I think uh, you know part of the reason um, at the time we didn't we, we hadn't been here too long and um, you know we weren't documented so she didn't want to confront the police she was afraid um, so she went back in um, within about 30 minutes we were there, we were just sitting there, and they kept on asking us, where are the computers, where are the computers? We said, we don't, we don't know anything about any computers. Um, my father's coming back from work that morning. He worked the night shift, and he's coming back. This is about noon now. And, um, and his first response was just to go walk over to the police and say, hey, what's going on here in Spanish? They didn't know any English. And he went up to the guy, the policeman, who he thought spoke Spanish, and he did. And, um, and he confronted him and he said, why are you, why are you have these kids? Get them off these cuffs, you know, get, you know, he was just, and I remember being afraid. I said, they're gonna do something to my father, you know? Um, <clears throat> and um, I don't know what happened that something clicked in their head that it wasn't right uh, for us to be in that way there. Um, and um, so they started releasing us one by one and, th and then he mentioned why he was holding us. <coughs> and, uh, my father said, we live right across the street in our apartment right there, and you can walk over, and you, look, you can look for computers if you like, but you're not going to find anything. Um, so you just need to let them go. Um, and they kind of went over to the side, and they, you know, talked to each other, and they decided to let us go. So that was my, my first uh, encounter <laughs> with vulnerability. Um, and I think um, the takeaway from that experience, and I think... Um, was this uh, divide, I think, um, that I think is kind of mentioned in, um, in the story, uh, in the book. Uh, but this divide between what kids bring with them when they go to school. Um, and, um, and I think uh, for me, um, you know, fast forward now, you know, to me being a researcher and looking into these issues is uh, the irony of it all is that on the same day in which I choose to spend my time um, working with race and equity teams uh, in, in Seattle schools is the same day that um, <laughs> one of my own sons is stopped. Um, <clears throat> is stopped along with a few other kids of color at a dance um, and tested for alcohol just because, I don't know, they looked the part, they look suspicious, whatever it may be. Um, and so I think, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I wanted to raise today is this whole idea of what it means to raise uh, boys and girls. Because um, um, I, I think one of the pieces that's under, you know, dis not discussed in, in greater length is, uh, is the effects uh, that this also has on, on young girls uh, and young women of color. I think it's understated. Um, uh, but in any case, um, I think we, we do a lot of work to uh, prepare our children to be aware of the hyper uh, vigilance that occurs in, um, <clears throat> out in the streets or in school where we think they're going to be safe. 
Um, and we shoulder them with that responsibility. Um, and where I'm hoping uh, the discussion goes is, is where we don't only put that responsibility on our children, and when we turn this around and we demand um, and ask more of our institutions, of our schools, of our teachers, uh, to be more than culturally responsive, but to actually get that mirror and face it, um, and face it. And, um, and that's where I'm hoping that these dialogues go, that, that they go to a place where, where all of us, everybody, um, our teachers are asking themselves those questions about whether they're fair in their dealings and encounters with children, whether they, they have examined you know, those, those histories that are also part of their own lives. Uh, whether they're white or, or whatever. Um, um, and, um, and the other part is just, uh, I think uh, the other part that I, I think this prompted me to think about is, um, is, uh, is, a, is a lack of, um, of dialogue and, and uh, spaces uh, to hold these conversations. And unfortunately, it takes a, an event like this to, you know, open ourselves to be vulnerable, but I'm, I'm not afraid because um, uh, <laughs> there's something I, I deal with every day, um, and so it's not, uh, I'm not afraid to talk about it, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping uh, that it, this is an invitation uh, for others to see the value and to open up and, and feel, you know, that vulnerability that, you know, kids feel and experience every day um, when they're out in in the streets or, or in schools. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Um, and I think um, there's, a, there's a lot to talk about. I have two black sons at home. And I'm married to a black man, and it scares me all the time about them being out in the world without me, because I see my husband as vulnerable also. He's 6'3", I mean, you know him, right? It's Joe Lott, you know who he is. But I understand him as vulnerable, and I wonder if me being present helps to shield him from the, the stories he comes home with. And I worry about our kids that are four and six. How to help them negotiate what's about to happen. There's no way around it. So how do, you, how do I equip them uh, with the ability for self-protection? So this is intensely personal. I can't even imagine your mother what vulnerability does to people that she had to go back in the house. I can't even imagine how horrible that moment must have been. <sighs> okay. All right, I'm gonna, okay, I'm back. This is, it's, it, this is just, I was, I was telling, I'm not sure who was up here when I was telling you, I was reading this book on a plane with my kids and it was the three of us sitting, my two kids, who are four and six, were sitting, we were three in a row, and my husband was um, on the plane, but elsewhere. And they were being, they're good travelers. They weren't kicking the seat, they weren't yelling, they weren't crying, they weren't throwing stuff. And this white man, I'm reading this book. It would have been bad no matter when, but I'm reading this book, and this white man turns around and says to me, are they going to be like this the whole rest of the flight? So he literally performed a disciplining of my children's bodies and me as I'm reading this book about disciplining black and brown bodies. And it was just, it was, it was it, for me, it was a reminder that every day you get chipped away at. And the cumulative impact of that is not insurmountable, but it is inc it was, it's sometimes almost debilitating in the, the 
constant nature of it. And so when I'm listening to the three of you talk, one of the things that I hear in all of these talks is that it's, it's not only, and I think this was an important part when you were kind of deep, understanding grit, when you were critiquing, talking about the critiques of grit, <clears throat> is that yes, some of it is about how do I help my kids resist, but the other part is to not focus solely on that, that there are institutional, structural, societal things that must change so that our kids are even just safe. I just want my kids to be safe. Like at, at a basic level, I think kids should be able to expect safety. That it's not just about them and policing their own bodies, and, uh, it, but that there is something else, something else structural um, that needs to change. I read some book reviews um, of the book because I was really depressed at the end of it. Um, it's, it's, it, it, it pulls no punches um, and makes no apologies. But as, the, as a mother, I was trying to figure out what to do. So I don't necessarily want to force us down that path into kind of creating some kinds of solutions. But I do want us to think about all of the different things that need to happen be outside of the individual kid. So I'll leave it at that.